Hey guys and welcome to another fourth advanced C++ tutorials. Now we're going to finally end the Lua C++ hybrid project tutorial series with a um, with a little look at how we can improve our debugging and error handling systems. Um, for starters, uh, I made this little program. Well, hmm, back up, slow down. For most bigger starters, um, quick little side note. Um, I never got to show you the compile and release stuff in the previous video when I was going over the compile release system. I never demonstrated it. And it turned out to be fortunate that I didn't. The compiler is slightly broken as it is shown here. I'm going to get a working version for Lua 5.2 available when I upload the source code. So it will be a little different than what's been in the video, but it will be working in the source code that I upload um, for Lua 5.2. Now, um, now let's get on to the topic, which is we need error handling abilities. And let's see why. I wrote these little functions. They are specifically written to break at a very specific point in execution. If I call this, uh, I make this empty table, and I'm going to call it A. A is going to say, hey, if uh, the N was 51, then we're done already. Uh, N was 0, of course, so we're not done. Then it's going to say, um, if, if, uh, only if TN is, uh, a real, uh, object. And since the ta entire table is empty, um, that'll never be true. This will never be true because, uh, nil is a fault, um, nil, I never explained this. Um, if you say something like if, nil, then, end, this will never get executed. Nil and false, um, never enter never uh, ex like are both falses nil and false both fail and if true any number including zero um, are tr is true um, a string is true uh, this string is true um, functions are true um, and tables as it turns out tables are true but um, nil which is the default value is false so you can say something like if t square bracket n square bracket, and if that va if that variable has never been set or that index has never been set to an object, that will be a false. And then I add this right here so that we ha see that there's actually going to be an issue because if um, this if passes, we're going to go to b and we're going to try to set values inside of um, j, and j is another name for t uh, square square bracket n square bracket. And so when we call b if tn is not a table, which it won't be, it's going to cause an error. But we're, we've got this if that's supposed to prevent that. I include this or just so we can create an error at some point. Now obviously this is um, a contrived way to create an error. But some time eventually, especially when you start creating complicated Lua systems, you're going to run into a point where there's an error being caused by something that's supposed to be a table actually being nil or actually being a function or a function that's supposed to be being returned by another function that's actually a table or the meta table if something isn't correct or all these possible crazy things and you're going to wish you had a better way to debug it because if I run this now, I'll compile first just to make sure we're running a working version. This is all I'm going to get. I'm going to get this... First of all, it's going to straight up break. So if I had distributed this, the um, program wouldn't even give me a good breaking message like I got there and show me where the break happened. But also, um, the only error message I get is main.lua.set at 17. So I get information about where the error is. But eventually the problem is so complex that only knowing that's not going to help you. I spent a lot of time going through and printing out, hey, let's print... Um, let's print a number one here, and let's print number two here, and number three here, so we can figure out where this break is happening. And it's really a, an unnecessary hassle. If we were able to see the call stack the way we can when we get a break in C++, we could forego a ton of that um, debugging work. So, let's see if we can't get ourselves a bit more flexibility. Let's make something um, like um, this. Um, I like to always format these for sort of, um, just to sort of look nice, um, with some 
lines when things start out. Um, and let's go with the words game start. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. Paste, paste, paste. There we go. And then we can we can do this. And this is where the magic happens. Um, this is just to sort of say this is the start of the uh, program. And then we're going to do something here. And basically what it's going to be is we're going to call main. But we're not just going to call main because if we get an error in main, that error is going to propagate all the way back to underscore main and then back into the um, system. And we, we, what we want to do is if an error happens in main, we want underscore main to be able to capture that um, and handle it. So uh, what would that look like? Well, we can use a special function in um, uh, in Lua called XP call. And it, it'll be looking something like this when we use it. Main uh, debug dot trace back. Okay, so let's take a look at XP call first. What's XP call going to do? Well, actually, it's based on a function called call, which we can use to just call a function. You can call the main function like this. But if you were to do that, it would be just as good as if we had done this, and so it would be just as good as if we had skipped straight to the main function. Now, what the XP call allows us to do is to kind of separate this one section away from this. Instead of us just calling it, and it's, not, and it's just the next thing up in the call stack, it's been carefully subdivided so that any errors that happen inside of main while it's executing won't propagate back into underscore main. This will actually just continue, um, continue on as if no error happened, and the error is contained inside of this call to XP call. Um, the P stands for protected, and that's why that works. Then Now, there is a function called P call that we could use, and it's got the same basic setup, except we don't have the uh, second ar function, and uh, our second argument to the function, and I'll explain what that second argument is doing in a bit, but let's just look at uh, the implication here. Now when we reach that error, um, we can uh, do something like this. If not fail, then, and all, by the way, the protected call and XP call, they both, um, they return true if no error happens. They return false if an error happens. So if there is not not a fail, basically, is our way of saying, is there a fail? Um, because this will be true with no error, and I just find it easiest to name things like this. I could say success and then if not success and all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense and I should have been doing that all along I just realized that if not success then uh, let's just for now say print um, let's print something sort of like this except uh, a little different so it looks like a big old error message um, we'll make it even longer maybe double as long boom boom we'll make it just really big so that it stands out. Actually, I doubled it. Shouldn't have done that yet. Hold on, I'll get this set up. So there we go. Now we've got this big old thing saying, hey, there was an error. And we'll know before the program closes. Oops. Got to recompile. There we go. So now game starts, and once an error happens, well, actually, let me show you this. Another thing I like to do is um, just print in the main function something like this.
just like that to say we're in the main function now. All right, run that. Game starts. First thing that happens, we print out the fact that main has started, and then all of a sudden um, there's an error, and that gets propagated up to here. But it didn't actually cause a break because that error was contained in a protected call. Because the error happened in a function, the the function that led to the error was called by protected call instead of regular call. When the error finally got re got propagated that far up, the error stopped propagating and instead got handled by an error handling function. Now, normally when we call p call, that's all that would happen. But we're also using debug traceback. So what is debug traceback? First of all, debug traceback is a function, and you can call debug traceback anytime you like. Let me give you an example. I could call it right here, debug. Well, I'm not going to take the main out. I'll do it right underneath. Print. I could print it anytime I want. Uh, debug dot traceback. Well, not it, but whatever it returns. So let's uh, let's call that. And there we go. That's what a debug traceback looks like. It's telling me what's on the call stack. And bef and this is happening before the error because I called it before I called the function a, which is what it ultimately leads to the error. So that's what our traceback looks like. Um, it's showing me at the time I called. It's showing me what the stack looked like, which was um, main dot lua eight, which is um, uh, right. Uh, let's see, main dot lua eight right there. So here we are. We get to this point in the main function, the underscore main function, and then um, after that we got to uh, we got ourselves inside of a C function. So we can't really see inside that, but we know this is here on the stack. So we've got an XP call being called there. And then that somehow led to um, 21, so XP call, uh, and that ended up right here in 21, and there we go. That's exactly where the traceback was supposed to show up. So great, that's how traceback works. It lets us see the stack. Now, what if we treat that um, right here? What, is that, what does that mean that I put it there? What it means is, uh, since this is extended uh, protected call, this isn't just protected call, which captures a call, it also lets me define a behavior to do once an error has happened. So an error happens, we take um, the error message and we uh, pass it to the, this function and it's going to take it and return an error message to print out. So I can actually go ahead and print out ERR as well and we will get a traceback whenever an error happens. So let's take a look at that. And boom, all of a sudden we can see a, a stack traceback going back to exactly uh, the beginning of the function or the beginning of the uh, system, which led to the call to XP call, which led to the call to the main function, which led to A recursively calling itself until it hit B, which led to us trying to index J. And now it makes sense. Actually, it made sense beforehand, but in other cases, that will have helped us make sense of, of what happened. So there we go. We've got a great system. And not only is this a good setup, but um, XP call can be used like this in many other cases. A lot of times, you... you uh, you're you're having debugging issues you can just put a protected call around something to debug it right there and then or we can call debug traceback whenever we need to um, to get more information even though an error hasn't happened right now so there's some good debugging tools to keep in mind one last idea before we uh, call it quits is let's look at the same sort of idea from a C++ point of view as you can see I've already switched this to a P call this isn't even a call anymore this is a P call so what is this what does this p call do? The p call in C++ basically does the same thing as xp call. It lets me protect the call and it gives me the ability to define an error function which I just defined to be 0. Now and that means don't use an error function, but I could pass an error function there and it would be able to handle error functions however I wanted. It would just have to be a C function unfortunately or a C++ function, not a Lua function. Um, although it could be a C++ function that calls a Lua function, as we've seen, that is perfectly possible. But what's more interesting than just that is if we were to like protect this call here, it would be just as good as us protecting that call right there, and which is what we're already doing. Then we're pretty sure that there's not going to be an error from there to there. That's all uh, perfectly good. The um, protecting this call though gives us some interesting abilities. This is the compilation uh, execution. We've um, linked everything together, and now we're calling everything just so that all of these functions, like main, main, a, b, we were going to define those by calling 
this link script. By calling link, we're defining all of the things, and then here we're actually entering into the program. So the question now is, what does it mean if I protect that? Well, what it means is I'm getting compilation errors. If an error happens where it says, hey, this particular script couldn't be compiled um, or couldn't be loaded, I'll get that error message. Um, or at least I won't cause an error to, to break. And if an error does happen, the error message will be right on the stack. And I can just do if, um, let's see, what was it? If Lua is string s negative 1, then, and then of course is in C++, the if needs parentheses, boom. So in here, now we know for a fact that we're in here, it means that there's a met, an error because there's only going to be a string on the top of the stack in the case that an error has happened and been, re and been put on the stack by pcall. So now that means we can um, take that and print it out. So maybe we do stdc out uh, lua to string s negative 1 and then uh, we return early and we uh, of course pop the stdnc dot get so we can see our message so let's um let's see if we can make that into something useful secondary is not being used right now what if i accidentally uh... made a comment with only one dash that would cause an error right uh... forgot to recompile I always i always forget to recompile before i make these runs so boom, now it's saying error loading module secondary, and it tells me right where I've got my error trying to load a module. So there we go. Now we have even abilities to catch where syntax problems are happening rather than uh, sometimes um, sometimes we don't have the fortune of, um, of a system that's going to break for us and give us the error message. A lot of times uh, when I'm working on a project, the error message will just flash up there and the whole thing will go away. But if we do this, then we guarantee we'll get to see the error message because we protected the call to load in the files and that means there, if an error does happen, it's not going to break right away. It's going to give a chance to see what happened and handle it properly. So, that is error handling and debugging in the Lua C++ hybrid program. And that ends our journey into the Lua C++ hybrid program uh, world, if you will. There's so much you can do with this, but it's up to you to really figure a lot more of this out. Um, immediately after this, I will be getting to work on Lua scripting tutorials, and by the time this whole series has been posted on the internet, on YouTube, um, I will also have a plan for C++ tutorials, and I probably will have them uh, made and ready to upload as well, and we'll start uploading uh, double at a time after this. So look forward to that. Um, the Lua tutorials will just be beginner to advanced, take you from a beginner in Lua to an advanced user. And then once we get you to an advanced user in pure Lua, we'll come back to this and look at more advanced uses of hybrid. Um, and in the meantime, C++, I'm not sure which direction we can go. I've had a suggestion that I do uh, design patterns, and I'm still researching whether or not I want to do that. I've had... Um, a long time ago, I had a suggestion to do uh, graphical um, stuff like SDL and OpenGL, and I, I said I would do that a while back, so I think I might go with that. Um, but uh, I might also do both. I might put uh, design patterns off until after the SDL. We'll see where I go with the C++. But um, definitely look forward to um, do the double uh, the double uploads coming up after this video. And... Um, as far as what we'll be doing in C++, as of now, I'm not sure. All right, so see you next time.